Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Kevin King, Michael E. Gerber, the author of The E-Myth, and Roland Frazier. Today, I'm speaking with Jamin Arvig. Jamin is the co-founder of AI Commerce, a multi-channel digital agency offering a full spectrum of e-commerce services. And we're going to be talking a lot about the growth lever of expanding your distribution channels. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Jamin, I started my business back in 2015. And I grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years, but I made a lot of mistakes along the way that made the path of getting to eight figures take a lot longer than it needed to. There were a lot of obstacles that I ran into that could easily have been avoided had I had a mentor or a guide along the way to help me oversee and overcome a lot of those obstacles. So to our listeners, those of you who are running into obstacles or hitting plateaus and want to know the next steps to take your business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com, that's ecom with two M's, to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving, I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. All you need to do is email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com and in your subject line say strategy audit and tell me why I should choose you and your business to work with for this month. And if you don't get selected this month, don't worry, you'll be entered to win for future months to come. Today, I'm super excited to introduce you all to Jamin Arvig. Jamin is a co-founder of AI Commerce, a multi-channel digital agency offering a full spectrum of e-commerce services, including launching strategies, ad management, and fulfillment. And he is also a partner with Buy With Prime. Jamin is also a co-founder of Brands 10X, which helps e-commerce businesses sell into brick and mortar channels and AIC brands, which invests in and owns multi-channel brands. He has been a thought leader in e-commerce for over 20, 20 years and an early investor and advisor for e-commerce companies, including Thrasio. So with that introduction, welcome to the show, Jamin. Thanks, Josh. Jamin, we originally met at uh, Camp Ecom, Brandon Young's event. You were speaking. I spoke and, you know, I was impressed with the amount of knowledge that you shared there. And it really got my mind going in regards to what we could do with our own brand to expand not only into retail, but just across multi-channel um, distribution to really capitalize and help take the brand to the next level. We've subsequently had follow-up meetings and we've really dove in and it has been super valuable to me and it has shifted my mindset and the strategy that we have in order to take our brand really to the next level. And really, now that we've crossed eight figures, go to that nine figure mark. And I really believe that that channel distribution strategy and going multi-channel is going to be a big part of that. So Jamie and I, I'm just curious, you know, how did you initially come, you know, become a co-founder in AI commerce and in brands 10x? I mean, you, you are involved in so many like really influential agencies that are helping take brands to the next level. How did that all come to pass? Sure. Well, we've been in e-commerce for over 20 years and originally we we're selling other people's products and then building our own brands. And then we started buying brands and growing those brands and creating more value. And then through that got, um, was asked to help with, with Thrasio, which had a vision of doing that same thing. And then also, um, because we started so early in, in e-commerce, there was an infrastructure that had been built already. So there wasn't fulfillment. There wasn't there weren't some of these agency um, expertise areas that were out there and available for people. So we had no choice but to develop those. And once we had those developed, other people saw what we were doing, saw the results and wanted to have a piece of that for their business. So we we did we spun off those service companies um, so we so we could help them. And so AI commerce uh, came from that uh, as an example of multi-channel digital agency, as you mentioned. And, 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 you know, 
the reason multi-channel has been such a focus for for um, for yeah, commerce clients is and for I guess many many people out there today is um, is because of the the value that can be created. And for us, when we we started so early in e-commerce, we started with Google search engine optimization originally, and then started adding different tra traffic sources and the expertise areas that were needed for them. And then as as marketplaces were introduced and different ways to play in the marketplaces were introduced, we started adding those. Um, and then as other channels were added, we added those. And as we as we wanted to round out our our uh, our channels for our own brands and for other people's brands, we, we went offline as well. So you can kind of see the the progression uh, where it made sense for us to add all these channels. And now the good news is we have this multi-channel expertise that is um, more necessary now than ever. Yeah. Jamie, I think I love that you didn't just do this on a whim. Obviously, like you've grown through all of these experiences and that's where like your expertise becomes so valuable here. So I've got a two part question to really kick things off here. Why is a multi-channel strategy so important to help a brand grow to the next level? And then the second question on that note is how does that multi-channel strategy influence the overall valuation for that brand. Sure. It, it's hard not to grow without multiple channels. So There's so many reasons that multiple channels can help a company grow. So sure, it's possible to grow without them. You're doing it. We, we've done it. Many can do that. But uh, when you have more, when you have more wins at your back, it certainly helps. And when there are downturns, it may be necessary to break even or, or even grow at all. Uh, is to have those multiple channels. And, and, and some of the reasons it's important is that uh, each channel has gotten more saturated, more expensive over time. When, when you look back, like I just mentioning with uh, Google SEO and then with Google paid search and then with some of the social channels and, and some of the different marketplace channels that developed over time, each one of these traffic sources or channels became more expensive over time. Um, originally, you know, it, it was the Wild West and it was a new open opportunity and and it was, you know, someone could figure out how to play in that pretty easily, maybe even someone could find out a loophole where, where they could develop a, a whole lot of growth in that area. But then there becomes sophistication in that area. Other players move into that area. There's competition. The, the platform itself develops ways to monetize. There's different ways to have advertising in these channels. And those ads get more competition and the bids go up and, and prices go up for the ads. And so you can see little by little the, the, um, the, the, uh, the prices in each of these channels gets much more expensive. Um, and so to 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 exist, to survive, to thrive in any of these, um, one needs to be adding these channels. Yeah, I love that. Now, on that note, Jamie, and I'd love to ask this question like um, to the guests here is where do you see things going for brands that are solely focused on Amazon only right now? What do you think the future looks like for those type of brands over the next three to five years? It's hard. I, I, I think. Uh, if a company is solely focused on Amazon, they, they are at risk of a number of things. First, uh, of course, you've seen it, but there's there's knockoff um, considerations. There's counterfeit considerations. There's black hat considerations. Fewer black hat maybe than in the past, but still there's all those considerations. When there is when there is an Amazon only product or brand that grows, it is very um, common uh, that that there are knockoffs quickly. And then those those uh, those knockoffs present. Um, uh, some erosion of margins, if nothing else, and and likely erosion of uh, of revenue as well. So, if someone is solely focused on Amazon, it does become hard. They need to be very, very good at product development. They need to be good at, of course, good at the blocking and tackling, good at sourcing, all those types of things. But all good at product development, so they can keep launching new products and not be dependent on those that they got them where they are. So, I think those are some of the things that are necessary to to survive on on a channel like Amazon in the future. If, if you're focused on that. If you're if you're looking at how can you how can you go beyond that, it becomes a lot more impactful, a lot easier because you can you can grow on the other channels and your brand awareness uh, grows and so many other things become possible. And as you say, looking forward for for years, I mean, we're, we're running into challenges like with the economy. We're, we're, we've got recession fears that are that are growing and uh, the, the market has already changed dramatically over the last year, I suppose. Right. Uh, with with aggregators like Thrasio that did a phenomenal job uh, bringing brands into their into their ecosystem. But then 
um, during that land grab, uh, there were challenges and and uh, uh, th there were um, th there were reasons to pull back. And so the the valuations and a lot of, for a lot of those Amazon brands went down, too. So um, I'm, I'm throwing a lot out here, but I think the, the point is that uh, to grow your business um, and to in improve your valuation, you can you can really do better by diversifying into more channels and and strengthening uh strengthening each of the channels but really trying to build a brand and not just build a product listing yeah i think that that is super important and you know i think the important thing that you're talking about here is you're not saying neglect amazon run away from amazon what you're saying is hey keep doing what you're doing on amazon to succeed right get better with your product development continue right. to come out yeah, with I, I products think on amazon right that's right I, I absolutely uh, Amazon is a key channel and will be continue to be a key channel. Uh, there, there needs to be a strategy in Amazon. There also needs to be strategy in these other channels and the yeah. strategies might be completely different. Um, one strategy for one channel might be to, to grow revenue and another channel might be to bring profit. Another channel might be to get eyeballs and, and brand awareness. Um, another channel might be to get profit to fund one of the other channels. So, or to drive revenue to bring the cost down for for the product. There's lots yeah. of ways to to play this, but you you want to have a holistic strategy that brings all these strategies together. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. And so I, I'm sold on the fact that it's important to stay ahead of the game and go to where the puck is, you know, skate to where the puck is going here. And that multi-channel distribution, I think, becomes even more important down the road. So my question to you, Jamin, is like, as we look into 2024 and beyond, you know, what are brands doing to evaluate all the different multi-channel fulfillment um, or distribution channels that they could get themselves into? Because the options are ultimately endless, right? Uh, so how, do you, how does a brand prioritize, this is the next channel I should focus on? Is it retail? Is it, you know, no, I need to actually get into more um, e-commerce channels or even international expansion how does a brand kind of make that decision and prioritize correctly it's a big question so i'll probably have a fairly big answer um and we can we can drill down into it as, as would be helpful for you but yeah I, I think you're absolutely right companies are are looking at this at the world right now and saying hi you know there's a lot of risk in my business i, I want to have predictable profits that that grow that are sustainable i need i need diversification I need to move into new channels. I also am concerned about my valuation. I want to drive the valuation up with more brand awareness, more impressions across the channels. And so what do I do? How, how do I how do I prioritize those channels? I, I think you said it very well. And and one of the one of the things to consider is the complexities of each of these channels. And so I, I would start there, really understanding your business and the complexities of some of the new uh, channels that you're considering. Uh, so, for example, uh, complexities would include infrastructure um, th th your current business has some integrations between amazon and maybe you've got an erp maybe you don't so if it's an amazon business only you may not even have need to have a sophisticated erp system but um you you do have some integrations now if you if you get more uh complex you're definitely going to need a, a solid erp system you're going to need integrations to that ERP, erp system with all of these channels that you're talking about you need uh, integrations into fulfillment with your with your own warehousing or with other warehousing. There's a, so there's a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, that needs to be built if it's not already there. Uh, digging deeper into tech, you've, you've, the data becomes much more um, complicated too, right? You've got dimensions to the data. It's not just one channel. You've got lots of channels. So you've got to look at the profitability by SKU, uh, by order, by channel. So there's, there's more dimensions to consider. And then yeah. in, in terms of the fulfillment, you, we've got we've got uh, so many complications there too. If you're an FBA seller, things can be pretty simple, um, it, and it's not as easy. Uh, it's it's challenging, but it's simple in the sense that you've got one one network for your fulfillment. So if you're doing multi-channel, um, you need to have fulfillment for uh, for other channels. You could use Amazon's multi-channel fulfillment network, but even that is has its limitations. But if you're looking at your own D2C site, if you're looking at other marketplace channels that compete with Amazon, if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at B2B and, and some of those channels, you, you've got a lot of additional uh, integrations, maybe SPS Commerce, Commerce Hub, 
you've got um, you've got other opportunities to fulfill with 3PL or your own warehouses. So there's a lot of complexities in the infrastructure, the tech, the fulfillment, the marketing capabilities, which are different. So before someone gets too excited, um, they, they want to look realistically at, at what they have today and and how that could change. And and and, and that's just one consideration is the is the complexities of the market. You also have to look yeah. at the, the many other considerations of, of, of what's what your business is good at, what, what your key strengths are, what what the what the uh, what product differentiators are and so forth. So I can go into more details if you want, but I'll stop for now. Yeah, I, I love that you kind of led with the complexity of each channel, right? And kind of going down the pecking order of how complicated is it to get into retail versus, you know, international expansion into uh, Amazon Canada, right? Or just U U.S. Walmart online sales, right? And taking an inventory of like, what are your current strengths and how are things set up? So, Jamin, I'll use this as an example to drill down further here um, and we'll love to kind of get your thought process because you have so much experience. Let's take a hypothetical like um, Amazon seller, even our brand considered. We're, we're doing eight figures here on Amazon US. Everything is run through FBA. Everything is right. So as I look at all the different channels that we could get ourselves into, what you know, and, and here's kind of the next question on with that is. Obviously, we want to find the levers that have the least amount of effort, but can provide an outsized return for us, right? The biggest return on investment. So with that being said, a U.S.-based Amazon seller that's 100% FBA right now, what are the channel prioritizations that you would kind of lay out to say, this is going to be kind of like your least complicated channels that I would attack first, and then this is kind of you know what I would then start to ramp up to that's going to require additional work and infrastructure before you can approach these phases. Sure. Yeah, I think I think that is the the first step to consider is building a list of the top channels that uh, that should be considered and and evaluated. And um, if a company is solely on Amazon and solely using FBA, like you say, in, in that scenario, I, I think it's it's pretty natural to look at you know other Amazon geographies, right? There, it's not as big a lift to do that in many ways um, in certain ways with with the administrative changes and taxes and all that kind of thing of course there is there is something some bit of work there um, but that is an easier lift than a completely new channel uh, usually uh, another common one is walmart you know another mass um, type of retail channel online where where a company can use similar strategies now i would say that those are maybe the top obvious ones to look at but then there's a whole host of others that actually may make more sense for you um, than those. Those are the obvious ones. But, you know, D to C, building a website, making sure you've got um, some synergy between your website and Amazon and the other channels that you're looking at um, is, is always important. You have to look at expanding that as, as a as a top opportunity for sure. Uh, there's other there's other product specific marketplaces, too, if you're in. Um, goods that would be sold as, as hardware goods or home goods, you're probably looking at uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and maybe Howe's and, and uh, Wayfair if you're in things like furniture. So there's there's um, product specific marketplaces that have grown electronics where um, electronics marketplaces as well, for example. There's others, too. So uh, you want to think about what is that list uh, first and then you can start digging into that list. And, and maybe the obvious ones are, are true for you. Maybe they aren't. But part of the way to figure that out is to really dig deep in into analyzing the the market intelligence of, of a channel uh, and what does that mean that that's looking at things like the the competitive landscape as an example are there products like yours uh, does the audience on those channels want products like yours um, and and how competitive is it uh, is there a big is there a lot of white space in that particular channel and a need uh, where people are actually searching for that type of product if so great that's a great opportunity and that should be prioritized uh, are there and then also with each of these channels, what what are the issues with them that that would prevent them from being uh, a low lift? Are there massive new capabilities that are required? Uh, do they require new fulfillment um, uh, capabilities or new technical capabilities or like we we're talking about earlier, some completely different marketing capabilities? So what is required uh, to make these possible? What kind of team changes would, would need to happen? 
Um, so those are some of the considerations. And then, and then thinking too about profitability. So if you're, if you've got a list of these channels and you're starting to prioritize them based on the opportunity, based on the complexity in terms of team, um, you can then look at to the profitability likelihood of each of these. What, of course, what is the revenue capability? What is the profitability, um, realistic outcome that would, that would happen? Each of these channels has, has different, uh, profitability, um, unit economic considerations. So are the, what are the ads expectation, ad price expectation or commission expectation or freight expectation? And, and so really what is the, what is the total profitability to expect? And, uh, it, there's also cash impact considerations too. Um, some, some of these channels pay differently than others. So you, if you're looking at your business holistically, you're, you're thinking about all things, uh, with financial objectives, with cash objectives and, and so forth. So there's a lot that goes into that. It, it's a big analysis as you were talking about earlier with, with strategy audits. I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a big, um, project to think about wh- how do I prioritize these channel opportunities, but it can be done and it must be done. Yeah. I, I love the way you kind of walk through that process and the thought process of, you know, hey, look at, you know, even keyword volume, look at the competitive landscape, look at what your profitability could be. I mean, there's so much to consider and also like assign a number to that amount of complexity that would be required for that channel. So I love that mind map that you just kind of laid out there, Jamin. Um, another follow up question on that note is, you know, I think ideally right if you're i love to use the fishing analogy if you're out fishing and you're trying to figure out you know what the fit how to catch the most fish you want to see which bait is working the best right and so ideally if you could cast out five different poles with five different types of bait you can see what's working and and double down and keep doing what's working and so my question would be this the analogy would be how could i you know maybe take baby steps where I am maybe casting a wide net and putting in mich- multiple fishing poles to see which type of, you know, channel could work best for me if, you know, we could do as much data analyzation as we want. But at the end of the day, you just got to move forward and, and actually test it out and see what the market, how the market is going to respond, right? So the question is, how do you take some baby steps to enter some of these new markets when you are relatively new and this is a kind of a new venture for you? Yeah, I love the question. It's a, you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking like an entrepreneur and you're thinking about how to grow and how to test fast and fail fast and and find success where you can. And then and then you can invest much more. Right. And so that, that's the right way of thinking about it. And and so you want to you need to do that. And and so I, I think, again, you, you don't short circuit any of the steps I just laid out. You, you might um, you might not do the most robust McKinsey level study, uh, but you're, you're going to have those considerations that I laid out. Um, and, and then you can start testing them and you, you pick, you pick the top three, four five, like you're saying, and, and you start, you start testing them. I think, um, it, it's always good to start with, um, a few products not all of your products and figure out what, what is a product strategy for them. And in some cases you, you may just want to start with your top 10 products, for example, your, your top products, whatever that is, maybe your 80, 20, uh, split where your, where your products are much more impactful on Amazon and assume those would be impactful in other channels. It's not always the right strategy though. And some, sometimes you want different products in different channels. For example, Target, to do something there, it really helps to have different products and unique products to get approved. So you want, you come up with a product strategy as well. And then you can have, you test with a, a limited number of products in these channels. Um, you can test what you, you have to understand uh, what, what the expectation is for, for advertising and what, what is a realistic test. Cause you don't want to have a, you don't want to throw fit five fishing poles out with no bait or with the wrong bait. You, you yeah. know, that's going to be a waste. And then you, you look at the poles and you see that there's no fish on those and you think, oh, that one, that channel's not for me. Well, maybe it is for you, but it was a poor test, right? So you yeah. want to make sure you've got the right test for each of these, the, the right types of product, the right types of pricing strategy, the right types of advertising strategy, and then you can get it out there. I, I think this is a, a reason for um, a company like AI Commerce to exist because it, it's, it's hard to go after all of these. So um, you know, it, it's helpful to use a partner that that is in these channels, that has expertise in the channels and capabilities in the channels that can quickly test some of these things for you. And then you can see what makes sense and not. And then you can have your partner drill into those much more if you want um, and grow the ones that are working. Or you can even over time bring those in house. So I think that's probably a general way of, of looking at, it. you know, have that have that smaller um, uh 
more concise product list that you're testing. You, you define a, a budget for, for the test where you're willing to lose money on the advertising or, or discounts or whatever it is. And then you, you, you bring people in that can help you um, perform a, an appropriate test, a real test, where you can walk away and know that uh, yes or no, um, and is this the right channel? And, and, or, and if it is, how do I win in that channel? Um, is it with a different type of product? Is it with a different type of strategy? Uh, so I, hopefully that can help people kind of get their feet wet. Yeah, I love that. I, I really like the mindset shift of like, you don't have to take all of your products, right? If you have a large SKU number like we have, don't get overwhelmed with, I've got to figure out my plan for a thousand SKUs. Figure right. out like, all right, which are my top ones? And let's really focus in on those. And let's start there. That's much, that's more of a bite-sized chunk that I could actually handle. Um, right. And we haven't talked about brick and mortar. I know you're, you're getting to that's that. What, and, that's my yeah. exact next question was, at which point do you determine, like in your experience, like is there a specific point where you see brick and mortar being a good option for brands or is it just specific for every single brand and there's no real rule of thumb here? Yeah, I think before someone considers brick and mortar, if they're an Amazon native business or e-commerce native business, um, th they need to understand that it is a completely different space. Um, you know, if you're Amazon only, you look at D to C and you think, man, that's a different world. I can't do that. Or if you're D to C only, you think Amazon's a different world and I can't do that. And the same is true for for a brick and mortar. It, it is a different world. And but you can do it if you if you've got a strategy, if you've got if you've got partners, if you've got a team that can help you get there. So when does it make sense to consider brick and mortar? I, th I think it um, you need to have a product that has been proven um, in your channel. Uh, you need to have uh, some type of proof that uh, th that that product works, some social proof. You've got you've got good volume. You've got good reviews. You've got um, you've got good exposure. You've got eyeballs on on this product. Maybe there's not huge brand awareness in the in the um, geography, but at least you've got proof that that this product can work. And I, I think you've you've got to have um, at some point either a you either already have things like packaging and collateral and those types of things, or you're willing to go invest in those things. Um, if you've got packaging um, uh, packaging strategy on your Amazon product, and, and you might hopefully you do. Um, that packaging strategy might be similar to your brick and mortar packaging strategy. It might be a little different, but it, that, that is one thing to consider. Uh, we can dr drill into that if you want. Um, there's other collateral that needs to be designed as well, but a lot of those things can be done after you decide to test out brick and mortar. The, the first though, you just need to make sure you've got, you've got a product that has social proof on it in your channels. And you want to make sure that your product matters in the brick and mortar channels. It's different than the others. It's needed. There's some demand for it. So you can do some investigation on that and 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 look at look at those markets. If it's a one of the majors or you know mass uh, merchandise like Walmart, uh, you can you can see what they're selling and if there's a place for you. Um, if maybe you're looking at getting in smaller stores that's more diversified, and, and maybe there's a, a need in, in smaller boutique shops or everything in between the category specific shops, but make sure there's some differentiation uh, that you can go to the buyers and show that, yeah, I've got a great product, great brand. You need this in your store. So I think those are some of the early things to look at. But yeah, that, that first question is, am I ready for retail? And you, you ask the right question that, that people should be asking. I think so if, uh, brands 10 X helps with this kind of thing too, to, to help people understand, are they ready for retail? And then if so, they can they can take a baby step or a bigger step into that. A baby step might be getting educated, getting, getting understanding what are the opportunities. Um, and, and so there's education opportunities to understand what is required for all these things and, and to actually do it. They, you know, the education can help people understand here, here is exactly how you get your packaging set up, exactly how you get your sell sheets, exactly how you um, find the buyers and how you talk to the buyers in, in these in these uh, brick and mortar stores. So I think that can be helpful to to uh, get people educated. And then if they if they want help um, uh, to have a, a team that has expertise that can actually go sell the product in, into brick and mortar, then they then they bring that in. The you know, brands 10x does that, or other companies do that as well to to help people build a new team in a new area. And it doesn't have to be um, a set of employees. It can be contractors. Again, a way to test. Uh, very very small uh, to to make sure there is some product market fit. 
and some momentum before testing more heavily. Yeah, I love that. And th- we could take the entire rest of the podcast and just drill into re- uh, brick and mortar retail because there is so much that goes into that. Um, but as we're running up on time here, Jamin, I'm curious um, if you have maybe a couple case studies that you could share with us of, you know, maybe native Amazon brands that have been able to successfully scale and grow and take things to the next level by implementing this kind of multi-channel uh, approach to their business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can uh, share some now, or if you want uh, some digital case studies to share afterwards, that's fine as well with more detail. But, you know, with um, with, with some brands, there's there's a brand, Lumi World, um, that was focused Amazon only, and then they they moved to um, in-store and and have more more business in store now than they had on Amazon. So that, that's one example. And and uh, and then now they're in the process of taking advantage of the the, the next um, the next multi channel opportunity, which is buy with Prime. And I've I don't know if you had that uh, on your on your list of questions, but I, I think it's a great a great uh, thing for people to consider when they're wanting to be multi channel. And to buy with Prime is an Amazon um, opportunity to to allow people on a, uh, a direct to consumer site to click a button where they can a, a customer can buy with with the prime account uh, so it's it's very easy for the customer uh, and as a result there's they're able to uh, have a 25 percent or more typically conversion rate lift on their direct to consumer site so that's huge if you can have that kind of lift and then you can spend more money on advertising more profitably so and, and the reason for this is again they've got that They've got that ease of use with that with that uh, buy with Prime button, but it also has the the, the branding behind it, the trust behind it, um, the the uh, the fulfillment network behind it. Most of all, probably, so the the customer knows they're going to get that product very quickly. And yeah. so we've we've done a lot with this. I'm a huge proponent of this. There's pros and cons. Trust me, and I can talk talk about this in great detail too. But um, but with the right strategy. Uh, buy with Prime can be tremendously helpful for a direct consumer or or an Amazon brand that, that's trying to move to direct to consumer. By the way, yeah, I, I love that. Any other case studies? Uh, I, I think um, think in, in another one that comes to mind is in the um, in the health health space. Um, Tier One is a, a brand that started on direct consumer, went to Amazon, and then went brick and mortar. And um, so the, their products have had to shift um, based on the channel a bit. It's a it's not a hundred percent overlap in all the products in each of the channels. So they've had to have a product specific strategy. But um, the ability to move into the different categories has been tremendously helpful in building um, in building not just revenue but um, brand awareness that that helps all of the channels. So all of the channels become more profitable and have better conversion rates. Because they the brand exists in multiple channels. Yeah, I love that. Now, Jamin, I love to leave the audience with three actionable takeaways from each episode. There are so many things that we talked about, and we could have even dug deeper into many of these topics. But here are some three actionable takeaways that I think our listeners could use going forward. Let me know if you think I'm missing something here. So action item number one is the first thing that a brand should be doing is creating a list of all the different marketplaces or channels that they could envision um, selling their product into, right? You've got Walmart, you've got Etsy, you've got Wayfair, Target.com, like the list goes on and on. But I think the important thing here is like list, actually create a list of each of these and then go back, hit rewind, listen to what Jamin talked about of here are the different like things you need to consider for each of these channels. You know, what's the amount of search volume being done for that channel for that your specific product? What's the um, the competition landscape look like for your product on that channel? In addition to that, what additional complexities may be required? Uh, do you have to change your product packaging? Do you have to change the way your logistics work? Do you have to hire team members to support this? and assign a value to each of those and then prioritize obviously starting with the least complicated but producing the highest return on investment first and go from there so that would be action item number one is create that list and score those different areas that we talked about action item number two i think is one of the crucial things here is start first with your best-selling products 
and don't get overwhelmed, especially if you have a large SKU count. Start with a few. Take that initial baby step. That's going to be much more manageable um, to take that next action. And then finally, action item number three is to partner with experts like yourself, people and guides and mentors that have been there, done that, that can help you see around those those blind curves that you're about to come around that you don't know what you're about to experience yet, but somebody else does. You will go faster. You'll make better decisions if you have somebody like that in the in your back pocket. Uh, all too often, I think entrepreneurs have the mentality, which can be good, but also bad at the same token of I can hustle, I can grind this, I can learn this and do this myself. Sometimes your time is better utilized, focused on the future vision of the business and allowing other experts to come in and help guide the formation of that vision. Jamie, is there anything else that you would add to the, these action items here for our listeners? I think you said it well, and uh, you know, happy to be a resource as well. That's why I'm here, trying to spread the word and the importance of multi-channel. So if, if anyone is overwhelmed or, or wondering if multi-channel fits for them or, or what the next steps are, feel free to... Um, uh, reach out to AI Commerce and, and someone there is, can have a conversation. You, you may qualify for a, um, either a quick um, audit to kind of think through the, the next steps that'd be easy for you or else a, a more in-depth uh, free audit as well to understand how you can win and how you can prioritize and how you can execute in these new channels. And I, I think it, it does help to talk to experts. And e even on the example with Buy With Prime, we've got we've developed um, uh, special relationships with Amazon. So we get um, lots of Amazon reps that help us and our brands really get to the next level of, with with constraints that that come up and customized strategies and, and ways to make sure those those uh, strategies actually work. So happy to be a resource um, and friend in this area. Awesome. So definitely check out AIcommerce.com dot com uh, for people and fortuitous naming, by the way, of uh, AI commerce and getting that domain uh, much earlier than the whole AI boom. Uh, Jamin, real quick here, I like to ask each guest the three following questions. So let's start with number one. What's been the most influential book that you've read and why? One of the books and theories that I prescribe to is uh, the, the uh, entrepreneurial operating system and scaling up. They're two different things, but very, very similar. And the books behind each of those are tremendously helpful. So I know a lot of people know these now, but if you don't, I uh, highly encourage you to look into them or get someone to help you implement them. But uh, the so uh, traction is the book with entrepreneurial operating system and then with uh, uh, the scaling up uh, philosophy the, the book is called scaling up and it, it just really helps uh, people have a, an operating system for managing and growing the business and i'm such a believer with brands 10x actually we we have programs to help people do this um, to actually implement these these things into their business um, they're very helpful i wish i would have done it earlier yeah those are great books i would Definitely echo what you said there. Question number two is what is a your favorite productivity tool or software that you've recently been using that you think is a game changer? Well, of course, everyone's experimented with ChatGPT, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm using that a lot, um, trying to integrate that into other tools too, like Gmail, for example, trying to um, have, have things that can be automatically written or updated with that. So I think there's a lot of AI tools that are that are quite powerful right now that that I'm using. And, and that's probably the the obvious one that, uh, that has been helpful. Do you have a favorite AI tool at this point outside of chat GPT? It's, it's uh, changing quickly. So I, I don't think any that I can uh, can really vouch for. It's, it's funny. A lot of these tools are, you know, 72 hours old or something like that. Yeah. Right. But they're yeah. developing and changing very quickly. All right. Last but not least. Who is somebody that you admire or respect the most in the e-commerce space that other people should be following and why? Well, I, I think uh, a leader in the space that I can that I can mention is um, in the aggregator space. We, we've talked about them already, but Thrasio, uh, founded by I've co-founded by Carlos Cashman. Uh, I think he's phenomenal at understanding uh, channel um uh, distribution and and ways to ways to ways to grow and and get into more channels and 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 um, specifically or or more generally I guess just business how one can leverage uh, and scale businesses so I I think he's been uh, uh, very impactful and I encourage anyone to to keep track of him awesome Jamin great insights today thank you so much for sharing your wealth and 
uh, wealth of knowledge and wisdom with us all today. Happy to be with you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.